Welcome to this Medicine Masterclass in Neurology, in which we will explain how to perform an upper limbs examination. Start by washing your hands, introducing yourself, confirming the patient's details and explaining the examination to gain informed consent. Offer a chaperone and ensure that the patient is adequately exposed. Position the patient semi-recumbent at 45 degrees. Ensure that you've got the relevant equipment. This includes a tendon hammer, neuro tips, cotton wool and a tuning fork of 128 hertz. The principles of a neurological examination involve a thorough inspection, examination of the tone, power, reflexes, coordination and sensation. The examination is to allow you to determine whether any neurological signs are arising from upper motor neuron lesions, i.e. central nervous system lesions, or lower motor neuron lesions, lesions resulting from peripheral nervous system damage, or a mixture of both upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron lesions. Remember that any upper motor neuron signs occur from lesions in the neural pathway above the anterior horn of the spinal cord, and lower motor neuron signs occur from lesions below the anterior horn of the spinal cord. There are key features which distinguish upper motor neuron signs from lower motor neuron signs. On inspection, fasciculations would be present in lower motor neuron signs as well as marked muscle wasting. There are no fasciculations seen in upper motor neuron signs and muscle wasting is as a result of disuse atrophy. The tone is increased in upper motor neuron conditions and decreased in lower motor neuron conditions. Power is affected in both. In an upper motor neuron condition, the power is affected in a pyramidal weakness manner. That is to say that the extensors are weaker in the upper limbs and flexors are weaker in the lower limbs. Whereas in lower motor neuron conditions, there's a focal pattern of weakness with only the muscles directly innervated by the nerves damaged and the neurons affected. You may note a pronator drift with upper motor neuron conditions and no pronator drift with lower motor neuron conditions. The reflexes are also affected in a characteristic manner. The deep tendon reflexes become hyperreflexic in upper motor neuron condition and hyporreflexic in lower motor neuron conditions. There are several ways in which upper motor neuron signs vary from lower motor neuron signs. Remember that upper motor neuron signs occur from lesions anywhere in the neural pathway above the level of the anterior horn of the spinal cord. Lower motor neuron signs occur from lesions below the anterior horn of the spinal cord. Firstly, on inspection, fasciculations are present in lower motor neuron conditions and absent in upper motor neuron conditions. You would find marked muscle wasting in lower motor neuron conditions and little wasting or rather disuse atrophy with lesions from upper motor neuron conditions. The tone is increased in upper motor neuron conditions and decreased in lower motor neuron conditions. Power, weakness is pyramidal in upper motor neuron conditions, i.e. the extensors are weaker in the upper limbs and the flexors are weaker in the lower limbs, whereas in lower motor neurons the weakness follows a focal pattern, with only the muscles directly innervated by the damaged neurons being affected. A pronator drift may be seen in upper motor neuron disease and not seen in lower motor neuron disease. The reflexes also show characteristic changes. The deep tendon reflexes become hyperreflexic in upper motor neuron signs and hyporeflexic in lower motor neuron signs. Clonus is observed with upper motor neuron lesions too. The superficial reflexes are lost in upper motor neuron signs and preserved with lower motor neuron signs. The Babinski reflex, which is an upgoing extensor response of the hallux following stimulation, is positive in upper motor neuron conditions and negative, or a, a downgoing flexor planter is noted with lower motor neuron signs. Let's now go and focus on inspection. Start by inspecting for any signs of mobility aids. Walking aids such as a wheelchair or a walking stick may give an indication about the patient's current status. Orthotic devices may be used to help with neurological conditions such as a foot drop or impaired mobility. If there are any charts or vital signs, also inspect those to give you an idea of the patient's current clinical status.
Now move on to inspect the patient. Inspect the muscle groups carefully, looking for any signs of muscle wasting. Marked wasting is associated with lower motor neuron lesions. For list fasciculations are small involuntary muscle contraction and relaxions which may be visible under the skin and are a sign of lower motor neuron disease. A patient may have a tremor, a resting tremor or an intention tremor and there are multiple etiologies. The patient may at rest have choreoform movement. These are brief irregular movements that are not repetitive or rhythmic but appear to flow from one muscle to the next. Patients with Huntington's disease typically present with chorea. Hypomimia is something you may notice on inspection as a reduced degree of facial expression associated with Parkinson's disease. Also look for any scars. This may indicate uh, surgery, either spinal surgery, upper or lower limb surgery. Assessing the tone should be done by assessing various muscle groups of the shoulder, elbow, wrist and arm comparing side to side. Ensure that the patient is fully relaxed and that you're able to take full control of the movement of their arms. Assess the tone in the wrist, elbow and shoulder. Assess wrist flexion, extension and circumduction. Assess elbow flexion and extension and shoulder circumduction. Examine for normal, increased or reduced tone. Normotonia, hypertonia or hypotonia. If hypertonia is present, determine whether there is evidence of spasticity, rigidity or cogwheeling and we'll just explain what these are. Both spasticity and rigidity occur in hypertonic states. Spasticity is typically seen with uh, pyramidal lesions and rigidity is seen with extra pyramidal lesions. There is a velocity effect. With spasticity, the faster the limb is moved, the worse or a more marked increase in hypertonia is observed. Whereas rigidity is velocity independent irrespective of, of the speed of movement of the limb, the degree of hypertonia remains the same. In spasticity, the initial movement is the slowest due to a more marked increase in tone at the beginning of movement. And this is sometimes referred to as clasp knife spasticity. Whereas in rigidity, there is uniform increased tone throughout movement, sometimes referred to as lead pipe rigidity. If a patient exhibits rigidity and there is a superimposition of a tremor, then this is known as cogwheel rigidity. Power should be assessed in the muscle groups comparing each side. Power is scored according to the Medical Research Council scale on a scale of 0 to 5. A power of 0 on this scale indicates no contraction, 1 is a flicker of contraction, 2 is active movement along gravity, 3 is active movement against gravity, 4 is active movement against gravity and resistance and 5 is normal power. Examine power in all of the muscle groups. Start by examining shoulder abduction. The muscle involved in shoulder abduction is the deltoid which is innervated by the axillary nerve. Ask the patient to flex their elbows and abduct them to 90 degrees and apply downward resistance on the lateral side of the upper arm and see if the patient is able to maintain their position. Next check power is for shoulder adduction. The muscle involved in shoulder adduction is the latimus dorsi, the teres major and the pectoralis major and these are innervated by the thoracodorsal dorsal nerve. Ask the patient to adduct their shoulders to 45 degrees and ask them to bring their elbows closer to their body and you should apply an upward resistance on the medial side of the upper arm and see if the patient is able to maintain their posture. Now examine the power in the elbow by examining elbow extension. Elbow extension is, is done through the triceps muscle which is innervated by the radial nerve. Ask the patient to flex their elbow, ask them to place their hands like a boxer and apply resistance and ask them to push their arm forwards to try and open up their elbows. Elbow flexion and forearm supination is coordinated through the biceps brachii, coracobrachialis and brachialis muscles which are innervated by the musculocutaneous nerve. Ask the patient again to keep their elbows flexed and apply resistance by pulling the forearm and ask the patient to ensure that you do not pull their arm away from them. Next examine power for wrist extension and flexion. The wrist extension is innervated by the radial nerve and wrist flexion is innervated by the median nerve. 
Now examine the power of the fingers. Finger extension, which is mediated through the extensor digitorum muscles innervated by the radial nerve, ask the patient to keep their fingers outstretched, apply a downward pressure and see if they can keep their fingers in a straight position. Finger abduction, which is mediated through the first dorsal interosseous muscle and the abductor digiti minimi muscles are innervated by the ulnar nerve. Ask the patient to keep their fingers nice and spread apart and see if you can close their fingers. Also examine the power in the thumb. Thumb abduction, which is innervated by the median nerve innervating the abductor pollicis brevis muscle, is tested by asking the patient to hold their arms and hands outstretched with the palms facing upwards, ask them to position their thumb over their palm and apply downwards pressure to see if they can keep their thumb maintained in that position. Another important thing to test in power is whether or not there's a pronator drift. This is a useful way for assessing mild upper limb weakness and spasticity. The muscles involved in, in this are the pronator muscles because in the context of an upper motor neuron lesion, the supernator muscles of the forearm are typically weaker than the pronator muscles. Ask the patient to hold their arms outstretched with their palms facing upwards and observe for any signs of pronation for at least 20 seconds. If no pronation occurs, you can ask the patient to close their eyes and observe once again, as this accentuates the effect due to obliterating the reliance on proprioception. The clinical significance of this is if the forearm pronates with or without downward movements, the patient is considered to have pronated drift on that side. And this would signify the presence of a contralateral pyramidal tract lesion. And this is just a reminder, the difference between upper motor neuron versus lower motor neuron with respect to power. Power is expected to have a pyramidal pattern, i.e. extensors weaker in the upper limbs and the flexors weaker in the lower limbs with the presence of a pronator drift for upper motor neuron signs. And a, and a lower motor neuron uh, sign would suggest focal weakness in the muscles directly innervated by the damaged nerves. After examining power, move on to examine the patient's reflexes. Explain to the patient that this will be done by gently tapping their arm in various positions using a tendon hammer. There are th three key reflexes in the arms. The biceps reflex, which is mediated through C5 and 6. The patient's arm is relaxed. The biceps brachii tendon is located, and that's typically found at the medial aspect of the antecubital fossa. The examiner's thumb is placed over this tendon and then tapped with the tendon hammer and you should observe for a contraction of the biceps muscle associated with a flexion of the elbow. The brachioradialis reflex, also innervated through C5 and C6, is tested by first locating the brachioradialis tendon, which is on the postural lateral aspect of the wrist, approximately one inch proximal to the wrist joint. With two fingers positioned over this tendon, tap with tap your fingers with a tendon hammer. Observe for a contraction of the brachioradialis muscle and an associated flexion, pronation or supination of the forearm at the elbow. The third reflex to examine is the triceps reflex mediated through C7. Support the patient's elbow in at 90 degrees of flexion. Locate the triceps tendon which can be found superior to the electronon process of the ulna and tap the tendon with the tendon hammer and observe for a contraction in the triceps muscle. Remember to compare reflexes on the left and the right. And here is a reminder that you're trying to determine whether there's abnormality and if there is an abnormal reflex, is that suggestive of an upper motor neuron sign or a lower motor neuron sign? The deep tendon reflexes would be hyperreflexic with upper motor neuron conditions and hyporeflexic with lower motor neuron conditions. Superficial reflexes are lost with upper motor neuron conditions and maintained with or preserved with lower motor neuron signs. When we come to talking about the reflexes in the lower limbs, we'll talk about the Babinski reflex, which is usually positive in upper motor neuron conditions. Next, move on to examine sensation. Examine sensation in a dermatomal distribution comparing the left and the right limbs. Five key points will allow you to assess individual dermatomes from C5 to T2 in order. C5 can be tested by applying sensation over Sargent's patch or the lateral deltoid. C6 
by examining the palmar side of the thumb, C7 the palmar side of the middle finger, C8 the palmar side of the little finger. T1 sensation can be examined by applying sensation over the medial forearm and T2 over the medial arm. In order to detect sensory disturbance, first apply the sensory object to the patient's sternum and ask them if they're able to, to appreciate normal sensation. Then with their eyes closed, assess the various dermatomes as mentioned. Aim to assess pain and temperature, light touch and vibration. This will allow you to examine the spinal thalamic tracts and the dorsal columns. Pinprick, pain and temperature, is mediated through the spinal thalamic tracts. So ask the patient to close their eyes and with a sharp end of a neuro tip, ask them if they can perceive the sharpness throughout in the various dermatomes. Vibration sense involves the dorsal columns. Use a 128 hertz tuning fork place onto the patient's sternum and ask them if they can appreciate the vibration. It's very important that you discern the temperature, which is what you're not aiming to assess, from the, from the sensation of vibration. And then tap the tuning fork and place onto the interphalangeal joint of the patient's thumb. If the patient is able to accurately identify the vibration and when you stop it with their eyes closed, then that's a normal vibration sense. If vibration sense is impaired at the interphalangeal joint of the thumb, then move on to more proximal joints in order. Start with the carpometacarpal joint of the thumb, the wrist, the elbow, the shoulder, to see where vibration is sensed. Similarly, proprioception or joint position sense also involves the dorsal columns. Begin by assessment of, the pro of proprioception at the interphalangeal joint of the thumb by holding the distal phalanx of the thumb by its sides, avoid holding the nail bed as pressure can convey communication, and move the thumb up and down and ask the patient to close their eyes and, and, and determine which direction the thumb is moving, whether that's up or down. If the patient's unable to correctly identify the direction of movement, i.e. proprioception is impaired, at this point then sequentially assess the uh, more proximal joints, the carpal metacarpal joint of the thumb, the wrist, the elbow and the shoulder. Sensory pathology can manifest in a number of ways. Mononeuropathies, where one nerve is affected, result in localised sensory disturbance in the area supplied by the damaged nerve. Peripheral neuropathies cause symmetrical sensory deficits in a glove and stocking distribution in the peripheral limbs. A radiculopathy occurs when there is damage to the nerve root, e.g. E by compression by a herniated intervertebral disc, and this will result in a sensory disturbance in an associated dermatome. Spinal cord damage results in sensory loss both at and below the level involving a dermatomal pattern and a sensory level, where cortical lesions will result in a sensory loss following a homunculus pattern. After sensation, move on to examining coordination. This can be done by the finger-nose test. Ask the patient to point with the tip of their finger to touch their nose and then your finger. Ensure that their arm is fully outstretched to examine uh, the coordination more effectively. The significance of this is patients with cerebellar pathology may exhibit dysmetria and intention tremor. That is the inability to properly reach the target. They may undershoot or overshoot and they may use their contralateral hand to help stabilize their movement. And this would, re this would manifest as ipsilateral cerebellar pathology. Another form of testing for coordination is to test for dystidocokinesia. This is a term that describes the inability to perform rapidly alternating movements and that is also a feature of ipsilateral cerebellar pathology. Ask the patient to place one hand flat and to rapidly alternate hand movements with the other hand. If the patient is unable to do this or the uh, movements are slow or irregular, this may indicate dystidocokinesia. So this would allow you to have inspected the upper limb, test for tone, power, coordination, reflexes and sensation, and then complete the examination by thanking the patient, explain that the examination has finished, summarize findings, and offer to perform a full neurological examination and organize the relevant neuroinvestigations and management. Thank you for attending this Medicine Masterclass.